Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this RedGamingTech.com video, we're going to be discussing as well as analysing tech news, which as usual has popped up in the past 24 or so hours. Hopefully you're having an amazing day. This is the second video on the channel today. The first one focusing on tons of AMD news concerning RDNA 3, Zen 4, and well, lots of other stuff, and NVIDIA's RTX 3080 Ti. I'll leave a link to it, of course, in the video description. This video, we're going to start things out with Apple, specifically a 5nm sock from Apple known as M1, which weighs in at 16 billion transistors. And while Apple are no stranger to producing silicon or their own silicon, this is a bit special. The reason behind it being special is not necessarily just the performance that Apple are claiming, but because it marks the end of Apple's reliance on Intel for producing chips, the CPUs, which of course are x86 based. So we're going to talk about a few of the points here. Now it is worth noting that as the time I'm recording this, there are still, let's say, several details which are not exactly fully fleshed out yet and we do not have independent benchmarks and honestly the benchmarks which apple have actually provided are not exactly in depth they are not um, perhaps as uh let's say fully fleshed out as what we would hope as a perhaps an enthusiast but what they are demonstrating is at the very least interesting the highlight is an eight core cpu which again is apple's own creation they are claiming it's the fastest performance CPU that they've ever built and offers up to 3.5 times the faster performance. Now, this CPU is also joined by their own GPU technology, which they are claiming is the fastest integrated graphics. There are up to eight GPU cores which are available on the uh, products. We'll go into the products in just a moment. And this can run up to 25,000 threads, which can handle multiple different tasks. Although Apple, of course, are really aiming this at professional workloads right now, not so much gaming. They claim that it has 2.6 teflops of throughput and can do things like edit multiple 4K video streams, rendering complicated 3D scenes, and so on and so on. And they also believe that one of the reasons for its performance is because they've done an in-depth analysis of how um, different applications on the Macintosh um, basically leverage GPU performance. And all of this stuff together, at the end of the day, the CPU, the GPU, and the entire SOC is really coming down to performance per watt, which is obviously extremely important. I'm going to read this verbatim. The four highly efficient cores deliver outstanding performance at a tenth of the power by themselves. These four cores deliver similar performance to the current generation dual-core MacBook Air at lower power. And all of this is, of course, incredibly important. Um, M1 features eight CPU cores, and they are basically... Um, four high performance cores and high and four high energy efficient cores. So it's a little bit like a big dot little design in that respect. Of course, this is still very early days from Apple, but it definitely is a great indicator of where the company are going. Rather interestingly too, so far we've seen two different variants of the MacBook Air. The first uh, is uh, an Apple M1 chip with eight CPU cores and seven GPU and a 16 core neural engine. The second configuration is basically identical, but with the key difference being eight uh, GPU cores. As for memory configuration, it's got eight gigabytes of memory, which is not exactly loaded, to put it mildly, and we're looking at 256 or 512 gigabytes of SSD storage. If you're primarily involved in the PC ecosystem, which honestly I am, then your excitement for this may be somewhat tepid, but it does pose some interesting questions as to the x86 architecture and what type of competition we'll see. 
There's a lot more that I could say on the Apple products, but as of the time that I'm recording this, which is basically at announcement, there are still a ton of questions. We don't have independent benchmarks, so I think that's a pretty good place to call this section of the video. However, do let me know what you think about Apple's solution. Um, I'm not necessarily sold on Apple products because of their lack of upgradability, and honestly, I prefer the PC ecosystem, so I'm more into like AMD, uh, Intel products, and the openness of PC ecosystems. However, um, obviously my usage scenarios are not the same as everyone's, and professionals do love Apple products. So it's going to be very interesting if these chips do perform as advertised at a low power consumption, it's going to be very interesting. Because at the end of the day, when it comes to portability, and, well, to be honest with you, even most scenarios, if you're able to perform at a decent, decent level, but also eat up considerably less power, that is obviously critical, especially in a laptop or other such device. I also, since we're in the A's, and I generally do like to do things uh, alphabetically, I also would like to kind of go back a little bit on uh, AMD, uh, because this did just literally pop up. And uh, so I, I missed it in the first video, so I'm throwing it as a small bonus into this video. Row Game has actually found evidence of a Narve 23 GPU, which has 8 gigabytes of a VRAM. There's not a huge amount of information as of the time that I'm recording this into the configuration of the GPU, but obviously this is more low end. Um, and we can probably assume that it's going to have something along the lines of 128-bit memory interface, because obviously 8 gigabytes of RAM, it's very unlikely to be 64-bit, let's just be honest. Memory speeds could be 14 Gbps, although it could be 16. And then the Infinity Cache, we can also presume, is going to be considerably smaller as well. Obviously, the high-end cards have 128, so this could be like 32 or 64. Obviously, um, it's not exactly being confirmed right now. But uh, I know most people, in terms of like grabbing attention, always are more interested in cars like the 6800 XT or the RTX 3080 Ti or whatever. But I do think the affordability and performance of low end is just as important. Uh, Amy yesterday covered the um, RTX 3050, which has 2304, he says, without actually checking. So I could be wrong on that. <laughs> CUDA cores. And uh, it seems to be gobbling about 90 watts of power, which is just over the TDP of what a PCIe card can provide. Uh, sorry, PCIe slot can provide by itself. But that's fine. It, it doesn't look to be super power hungry. It also does mean, of course, that AIBs cannot uh, have to worry too much if they want to put out a super duper overclocked version, which c comes out, you know, it gets up in the morning and makes you toast. But... Um, I suspect that this card will be very low power consumption. AMD could potentially do this on just a 75 watt um, TDP, which obviously would mean that it would just be powered by a PCIe slot, which could be potentially amazing for different things like small form factor configurations. Again, we don't have benchmarks yet, but it's, it's quite interesting. I don't know if eight gigabytes of RAM is exactly going to be needed, but given just how AMD are bringing up the card, it does make sense from a uh, you know performance standpoint. And now onto some console news. The first thing I'd like to discuss is Spider-Man Miles Morales. Um, the PS5 gets released in about a day into the United States with the UK and other regions about a week behind. So we've got a while to go yet. And there is, of course, a lot of excitement. Demon Souls, the actual um, installation size, just for FYI, is just over 50 gigabytes, what I just read. Uh, that's just a small bonus piece of news. But Spider-Man um, apparently is just scratching the surface of the PlayStation 5 hardware. This is an interview with IGN, so I will, of course, link the uh, article in the description of the video. And... Um, Fitzgerald, who is the um, Insomniac 
game's core technology director, so you assume he's kind of knowing what uh, is going on here. It feels like we're just scratching the surface of what we can do with hardware like the PlayStation 5. That sort of can take a game model like Spider-Man and make everything really fast. Even the Ratchet and Clank game we're working on is leading into that a lot. He also said that developers will have years and years of scraping more and more performance out of the PlayStation 5 and doing things that are crazier and crazier, end quote. This actually really ties in perfectly with uh, a leak of mine recently. A developer was speaking to me off the record, so to speak. In other words, they didn't want to be... Uh, well, that's not actually the right term, but they were speaking to me without wishing to be identified. And... Um, they were telling me much the same thing, that the PS5 hardware is pretty easy to get into, but features like the geometry engine are what is going to take time to fully leverage. It's basically possible to just largely ignore it, as Mark Cerny stated in the Road to PS5 event. However, it's the programmability of the geometry engine which is so powerful, and it allows a lot of control over the rendering pipeline of the console, like insane levels. I actually have some more information of this, uh, about this, that I'm not going to put in today's video because it's already fairly lengthy, and honestly, I'm writing a couple of interviews for a couple of companies at the moment, so I need to get that done so I can send that over to them. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to be going rather extensively into what I learned, so the video is going to be like twice as long, minimum. But um, suffice to say, others have actually wrote back to me after I put that video out and seemed to be largely backing up what I said in the uh, that video, what uh, developers told me. And they basically told me that the VRS implementation is super early in the pipeline. So this means that you can not only cull vertices or geometry, let's just make it easy and say geometry, really early in the rendering pipeline because of the way that it's basically a... Um, highly advanced mesh shader, so it is compute based, but furthermore, VRS variable rate shading could be implemented much earlier in the pipeline too, so you're saving even more performance. However, to reiterate what I said a moment ago, this stuff is going to take time for developers, and I was told uh, in the interview that it could be second or third wave games that we're going to start seeing this stuff implemented, so that does seem to be one of the things that Fitzgerald is referring to here, but really and truly, both the Xbox Series X and the PlayStation 5 are going to benefit over time as developers get used to things. I've mentioned this multiple times, that engines at the moment, for the most part, are not really built around next generation in mind. Unreal Engine 5 is a good example of this, like UE5 is not even available to games developers in terms of releasing actual games. They can mess around with it, but you're not able to actually release a game on it, so they're still on the later versions of UE4. Um, and obviously, uh, UE5 is basically designed from the ground up for next-generation consoles, although it will work on other things. But things such as Nanite are incredibly important for next-generation and so it's going to be one of those things where we are on a journey with the next generation hardware. And um, I think there are a plethora of different obstacles and um, not in a negative way, but just for example, a lot of game engines now, they're not designed around having fast access to storage. So I think that's going to be one thing. And even the mindset of developers actually understanding how to fully leverage that. The next thing too, is that I doubt um, a lot of pipelines, graphics pipelines, are fully designed from the ground up with ray tracing implementation. So I think ray tracing will probably get a lot more efficient and a lot better visually as the generation continues. And this is, of course, for both consoles. And the other factor, too, is just things like CPU performance. Like, the Jaguar cores inside the PlayStation 4 and Xbox, the Xbox being slightly faster in terms of raw frequency, they were not ever designed to be high performance. That's one of the reasons we saw the shift to GPU compute, so that physics and so on could be offloaded somewhat to the GPU. Uh, yeah, and then now, of course, we have these 
high performance CPU cores in the next generation consoles, which are much faster, not only in terms of raw clock frequency, but also have SMT capabilities. And furthermore, they have much higher IPC, which means not only are they running at much higher frequencies, but they are doing much more work per clock, which is basically a win every single every single metric they just absolutely demolish stomp on what the old uh, consoles were capable of and it's going to take time for developers to really leverage this um but in my opinion anyway it's going to be super exciting to see what the consoles are capable of and if you're a pc gamer which i am more of pc gamer as regular viewers know this is going to translate perfectly to what we see um, in PC space, like uh, yesterday, I put out a video showing i7 4770K running with an RTX 3080. And while the minimum frame rates, especially the 1%s, were much lower than what we would see on like a 10900K, it's still impressive to me that a CPU which launched in 2013 is even slightly able to power an RTX 3080. And it's really because game engines have not been designed necessarily to fully take advantage of high performance CPUs simply because of the previous generation holding them back. I mean, there are other facets that I am ignoring here, but keeping things simple. So without any question in my mind, I think the next couple of years are going to see a fundamental shift in the requirements in PC space. For example, SSDs are probably going to become basically mandatory um, but also, of course, much higher performance CPUs as well. Uh, this is something else I was discussing with Matt Hargett and um, Bob Duffy from Intel and a podcast. So, you know, those guys kind of know what's up uh, in the PC space as well, just the gaming space. So I'll try to remember to link it in the video description. If not, you can just search like Bob Duffy on the channel or Matt Hargett and uh, you will find a couple of podcasts and discussions. It's, it's, you know, pretty cool stuff. Anyway, the last thing I'd like to tackle is uh, something uh, regarding the Xbox. As there have been a couple of videos that have been circulating online concerning smoke coming out of the Xbox, with one of them getting an absolute crap ton, that's a technical term, load of views. However, it could well be fake. There's a Twitter um, account by the name of Xbox Studio. I'll, of course, link it in the description of the video again. And um, if you use Google Translate, you can see that um, they basically show how most likely, at least, well, at least in their opinion, it's it's being shown off. And that is basically, it's kind of like vapor and it's coming through the console. And I have to say, my personal opinion is that the Xbox Series X does not look like it's burning. The, like the color of the smoke and so on doesn't look right to me. Um, there's also so much of it coming through. Um, with that said, I do fully suspect that there will be a number of consoles which are essentially broken uh, and have issues like there's probably going to be a number of consoles which either are noisy or have you know problems with the optical drive or just don't load or whatever we are seeing some reports already from journalists with the playstation 5 and a couple of reports as well for the xbox and i do think that these problems are going to be there but in my opinion anyway i think what we are going to see uh, just because of, you know, console war antics, there's probably a number of people who are genuine, but there's also going to be some fakes as well. My personal opinion so far is that it's kind of business as usual. Um, the PS4 and the Xbox One both had faults. We all know about the Xbox 360 with the RROD, which took a while if memory serves it did take a while for it to really become a problem because obviously that was just a design flaw on the way that the um uh, cooling solution of the 360 was created it put an awful lot of strain on the board which um started to cause issues with the pcb the actual board itself like the solder uh, so you could do things like people were putting the board in the o uh, in the oven so that it would try to reflow the so you know people were just trying any and everything to fix the damn thing but 
Microsoft, of course, did fix this with hardware revisions of the 360. The PS3 had yellow light of death issues, but I don't think they were too uh, super prevalent. So what I'm trying to say is that faults have been pretty much part and parcel of console launches. There's always, of course, that very small minority. Um, I'm expecting 2 3%, honestly, of failures within the first year. That's kind of normal to my understanding. Um, again, I'm not trying to say that all of these are fake. I'm pretty sure that some of them will be real. But I think that it's way too early to jump on any notion exactly of, you know, large numbers of failures. Because at the end of the day, um, a lot of people are, you know, having these consoles and not reporting any issues. And they're just, like, busy playing games. And, of course, you always get the small minority which do report issues because, well, they are experiencing issues. As as the normal thing goes, you tend to not complain if you, or, or say much if you're busy pew-pew-pewing on Doom Eternal. Um, but, yeah, anyway, I think that's just about it for this particular video. Hopefully, you have enjoyed it. The normal stuff, if you did, like, share, comment, and subscribe. And I'll see you soon. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.